Welcome back. My name is Darren Germain, and I am the Administrative Director of the Community Care, Rehabilitation, and Nephrology Programs at Health Sciences North. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Janice Eng, who will be speaking to us about moving stroke research to practice to benefit people with lived experience. Dr. Eng is a University Killam Professor in the Department of Physical Therapy and Canada Research Chair in Neurological Rehabilitation at the University of British Columbia. She is also the director of the Rehabilitation Research Program at the GF Strong Rehab Center in Vancouver, British Columbia. Janice is the developer of the GRASS program and the FAME exercise program, both of which are offered across the Northeast. We are very fortunate to have her present to us today. Welcome, Janice. Good morning from uh, the West Coast in Vancouver and uh, really pleased to uh, share my research with you. Um, I'm Janice Singh, as intro uh, uh, provided. Just wanted to note that we just merged two research centers, so you'll be hearing about our new center, the Center for Aging Smart at Vancouver Coastal Health, where SMART are, stands for Solutions for Mobility, Activity, Rehabilitation and Technology. So hopefully you'll hear more about that. My disclosures, I have uh, one commercial interest with the, as a consultant with the company BrainQ. So in this presentation, I'll be talking about the knowledge to action cycle to move research evidence to clinical practice. And I'll also explain the relevance of the GRASS program in improving upper extremity recovery after stroke and also chat about the fitness and mobility exercise program fame in improving function after stroke. And all of this will be really focusing on an implementation framework, which I hope that others might be able to use, not just for these programs, but other programs as well, of moving evidence into practice. So many of us have heard that it takes, on average, 17 years to move research into practice. And this is an enormously long time. It really is from the very beginning of starting a clinical trial to getting regulatory approvals and then moving it into practice if it works, because a lot of research doesn't actually work. And so it never gets moved into practice. And then finally, there's some uptake, whether it's in the hospital, in the community. Um, so this, you know, when you consider the cost of research and the fact that much of research, even if it's successful, doesn't get implemented, it's really not an efficient system. So why is it that we're not seeing that? Um, researchers have not been concerned about the gap between research and practice. And that's in part because our research hasn't been funded this way. And, and in fact, 10 years ago, I was not allowed to even spend grant money on implementing. Um, and the funding agency said it was not allowed. So this really has changed over the last 10 years in that there's been recognition that implementation research is critical. If we want to get the evidence that we do into your hospitals, into your communities, simply having it in a published journal is really not going to go forward. So how can we do that? So it's been really a journey over the last few years in which Canadian researchers, Canadian funding agencies have actually woken up and are really trying to work together to try to uh, figure out what kind of funding is actually um, going to be viable uh, for researchers and the stakeholders to partner together. As we know, uh, knowledge translation really doesn't work if we don't partner with you as the healthcare providers, uh, policymakers, and administrators. Um, and how is it the best types of frameworks and theories and backgrounds to get our research so that it is sustainable and continues uh, in practice? So it really has been a resurgence. It's still very much a new field. In fact, uh, this particular journal is called Implementation Science. Um, it was launched in 2006. It's just over um, 
uh, 15 years old. Uh, it studies the methods to promote the, the uptake of research findings into routine practice and improve the quality and effectiveness of healthcare uh, services. So, you know, compared to other journals, um, you know, biology journals, which are over 100 years old, really implementation science is relatively new. Uh, we might um, uh, be thinking that, you know, it, it still needs a lot to be done. Uh, but just to remember that we are really at the front end of a really new field. It's only been recent that uh, faculty have actually been appointed in this area. In fact, in our Department of Physical Therapy, we have one faculty who was not recruited as our typical uh, a, a neurological physical therapy researcher or a musculoskeletal or orthopedics or or cancer, um, we actually hired this faculty member to be an implementation scientist. So that's something relatively new. And there's only a couple departments across Canada that have implementation scientists. So as you can see, it's it's a it's a, a new entity and hopefully it's going to make an impact in how we view our research and what we actually value as research as well. Uh, just to give you some Canadian context, uh, we are really, really fortunate in Canada. I would say that Canada is one is considered one of the leading uh, experts um, in the field of knowledge translation. Um, in 2006, Dr. Ian Graham was appointed to be the uh, VP of Knowledge Translation at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And this is our major funding body that we have in Canada. Um, uh, he is from Ottawa um, and had a background in knowledge translation and really one of the world leaders in this field. And in particular, um, he was instrumental for many things. One is to ensure that the uh, Canadian Institute of Health Research, uh, CIHR, really changed its mandate to include, not only include, but to really value knowledge translation, to put funding behind it as well, and to have grants that researchers could compete for. So that was really, really new for us. Um, the other thing that has been uh, really special is that he is the developer of something called the Knowledge to Action Framework. Uh, and this has now been you know, used around the world, but particularly in Canada because of his influence. And there are actually many knowledge translation frameworks, but his is a nice one because it's, it's really easy for people to understand. So I'll just step you through this. In the middle is all about generating the knowledge. So in this middle part, you are uh, running clinical trials. It might be randomized controlled trials. You might be synthesizing the data, uh, looking at a systematic review of the evidence or a meta-analysis to bring you know, 10 studies together. Uh, from this, you are then identifying from this knowledge, what is it that we should implement? Because there's many, many things. And how do we select that? And many people select it based on things like how effective it is. Is it meaningful to the patient? Is it going to be meaningful to the healthcare system and services as well? Is it feasible because perhaps it's you know expensive or not expensive? So these are things that are considered when identifying whether to actually implement something. Uh, generally, then there's some type of adaptation to adapt it to local your local context because uh, implementing it in um, Vancouver and running a trial there is going to be very different from perhaps in Sudbury where there's different needs. Uh, assessing the barriers to this knowledge use, um, then implementing the intervention, monitoring, how does it you how's it being used? And particularly, what is the fidelity of the intervention? Is it being used as I imagine it to be used? And 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 as it was in the in the original trial as well, because you really want to be able to get the same, you know, quality and, and magnitude of the effects that the original trial had. Evaluate the outcomes. Um, and then Really importantly is sustain this use because if you, a lot of times in research, we implement something once or maybe twice, but the whole point of 
knowledge implementation is that you are going to run it in real time in your healthcare setting and it's going to continue. So despite somebody going on maternity, paternity leave, um, people getting healthcare providers getting sick, healthcare providers leading, leaving and coming back with reorientation, are you able to say, sustain the knowledge of this intervention? Uh, it's cyclical in, in that um, the cycle then uh, looks at uh, iteratively improving it uh, and improving the implementation. So this is the knowledge to action framework. We did an exercise um, with the international consensus panel on what is it that we should actually move uh, to practice in uh, stroke rehabilitation. Um, and this uh, particular exercise uh, utilized over 100 um, people with stroke and their families and over 900 uh, healthcare providers from different disciplines all over the world. Uh, the, the ones that they were, uh, that we found uh, across the spectrum was uh, interdisciplinary care. So figuring out how uh, teams can work more effectively together across the disciplines. Um, screening uh, and implementing screening procedures uh, in stroke, particularly in uh, dementia care, um, as well as dysphagia for, for swallowing as well. The implementation of local clinical practice guidelines that were already established, but how do we get them into play? Improving the intensity of motor recovery, because we know, particularly in the field of rehabilitation, that there is a window of time in which um, people do recover most because of the brain plasticity, which is about the first two months, two to three months after stroke. So if we can actually up that intensity, we get better outcomes. Um, improving family support, education around it, providing guidance and structure. And uh, the last two really dealt with the system parameters. So in increasing access to services and improving transitions to care. So these were considered priorities and had sufficient evidence behind them and protocols behind them to actually implement today. So that's why they were selected as priority. So I'm going to talk about one of just one of those many topics that I have expertise in, and that that is in the area of motor recovery. So in terms of motor recovery, what is it that we know that actually works um, from randomized controlled trials? Well, we know that if you exercise, three uh, sets or repetitions of 10 can improve your muscle function. However, that actually is not true um, in, uh, in an individual with stroke. And we know that thousands of repetitions are needed to improve the brain, which in turn improves the muscles. So it is not three sets of 10. And this has actually been really difficult to implement in clinical settings, even though we know this from animal studies, we know this from human studies. Um, there obviously is a time barrier to getting so much repetitions um, in clinical practice. Uh, there's problems that it's kind of boring to do thousands of repetitions. How do we actually get it so that it's actually done with some type of fidelity and that it's actually have an effect? So I'm going to start with looking at arm recovery after stroke. Um, this uh, picture is just showing uh, someone doing the GRASS program that we have. And this is our GRASS book uh, that we give out to patients. Um, and these are just some of the uh, pieces of equipment um, that patients collect either by themselves, things like cups and jars and clothes pegs. Um, there's a couple items that we have them buy, such as a weight. Um, uh, this is just a hand gripper as well. Um, and these are some, and we also usually have their putty. I don't see it in the, in the picture that they usually have to buy, or they can actually make their own. We give them a recipe for putty as well that they can make as well. So this program, um, we ran a number of trials, uh, and really the point of this was try to increase the repetitions without, um, 
substantially increasing the workload uh, for clinicians. So uh, this is the GRASS program. It actually stands for the Graded Repetitive Arm Supplementary Program. Uh, we, we do a lot of acronyms. Uh, we find, uh, for one, acronyms are free for us to do. So that's the really nice thing about them. Um, but they really are a fantastic knowledge translation tool because uh, researchers, clinicians, patients, really associate the name, in this case, the GRASS program, it was easy for them to identify and remember. I don't think many people remember what the actual real name stands for, but it is a fantastic knowledge translation tool. So if you if you are developing programs, uh, take a little bit of time to come up with a good name or acronym because it can go a long ways. So this was the original multi-site trial uh, that we ran with uh, just over 100 stroke inpatients over four different sites um, or four hospitals within the first four weeks of stroke. It was um, a self-directed arm and ha hand supplementary program and the patients were asked to practice at least one hour per day. And there is advice within the program of what they should be doing. There's pictures and how they should um, increase the intensity or the challenge on a daily basis. And the therapist spent about 20 to 30 minutes uh, per week uh, with the patient, uh, really guiding the patients, providing uh, them with feedback. So, for example, ensuring that they filled out the logs of how many minutes they were doing it per week. Um, they were uh, ensuring that if there's any problems with any of the, the exercises that they could uh, show them uh, how to correct the exercises. And these are the results that we did. We use the Shadok arm and hand inventory. This is a, a particular um, assessment that looks at very functional activities such as brushing your teeth, um, drying your, your neck with a, a towel. And at baseline, the groups were fairly similar. Um, the grass group in blue uh, was clinically significantly higher after four weeks and was continuing to improve even out at about our five to six point month. Likely, even though we're not providing any treatment after four weeks, what we did expect is that they would be using the arm more in their everyday function and continuing to improve. They also had improvements in other scales, one called the action research arm test, uh, grip strength, and this is a self-reported amount of use scale called the uh, motor activity log. This is just what the book looks like. Uh, it is free and available at our website, neurorehab.mab.ubc.grass. Uh, um, it has a lot of information of why do I need to spend so much time on these exercises? I think this is really, really important to get buy-in from the patient and the family that they, they truly understand the relationship between the brain pathways that are damaged and they repair these pathways and it takes thousands of challenging repetitions. This is really important for them to understand and we reinforce this over and over again with our participants um, so that they understand and know that it's supposed to be frustrating. It's okay to be frustrating. So that's something we really, really um, emphasize. Uh, and these are just some of the pictures uh, from the book. Uh, this is a grip strength uh, exercise, you know, so flipping uh, checkers over. So, you know, they're not, um, they're, they're really easy uh, uh, to access, uh, easy to understand. We have very simple grading, use a larger um, uh, item here or use a, a smaller one, such a dime or penny. And again, here is another page, again, emphasizing as I flip through the book, the exercises need to be difficult. You should mishandle or drop an item at least once per set. And it's normal to feel some frustration. Really trying to emphasize um, that it's okay to feel frustrated. And I think that really reduces the pressure um, of the participants that they know this is the normal way I should be feeling. We also get them to use their stroke affected hand as much as possible during the day. And they, we have a list in which they start to tick off and generate what are they actually doing at home so that we transfer these techniques and the learnings that they do in the lab to home. So 
are they able to uh, use, are they using their hand at home to turn a key, to brush their hair, open a drawer? And they continue to increase that list um, so that it, you, they may have 40, 50 items that they can do. And it can be as simple if someone has really um, a lot of impairment to be, at the beginning, it might be something like to push a tap on and on or to pull my sheets up in bed, things like that. And then getting into more complex things, flossing the teeth is always one of the most difficult things uh, if you have a, a hand affected by a stroke. Uh, this is the knowledge translation of GRASS. It's used in uh, over 600 uh, sites in 42 countries. And these are really just sites that have told us they're actually using it. Um, there's many other sites that download the book and simply use it. So we don't actually know all the ones that are, that are really using it. They did a, a survey for uh, the UK therapists in the neuro field. Um, and out of the people they surveyed, 35% of the therapists were using GRASS. It is part of the Canadian uh, Stroke uh, Best Practice Guidelines. Uh, and it's used in uh, conjunction with uh, neuromodulation paradigms. Um, its most common use is as an individual program um, or as a group program in the inpatient or outpatient setting. However, we've actually adopted it now as a, a group setting in more chronic uh, settings. Um, and that has actually been really successful as well because we've actually, although you do make the most uh, improvements probably in the first two to three months post-stroke. We've had um, our patients, even with more chronic stroke, make really clinically meaningful improvements for them. One of the things we did find in a series of studies was that the clinicians were not do always doing grass as we had imagined. We, we, we did not imagine this as simply a book that they gave to patients, and we don't believe it's actually effective that way. And that's what we found that therapists were actually doing. So we came up really with what is it that makes grass grass? And these this is an acronym eclipse that we came up with. One, you must equip the patient with the book. You must coach a patient on how to do the exercises. So simply giving it to them is not sufficient. The patient must log the grass time or and have some oversight from the therapist. Uh, it must involve the family and the caregivers um, when possible. Progress the patient weekly so exercises are challenging. Support and motivate the patient. And set targets so that they are transferring their ability to use a grass into everyday functions. So these were really important for us to try to define. We've also come up with audit uh, lists for this as well. Uh, we've also taken it, as I said, into the community uh, simply because we are finding that rehab programs are getting shorter and shorter and discharging patients earlier and earlier where they can certainly benefit from uh, the ongoing rehabilitation uh, activities. Uh, so this is just an example of one of our, our community centers where we've implemented uh, GRASS. Um, in these kind of programs, what we've done is that uh, people living in the community come to the community center. They, they're actually doing GRASS at home not doing it in the community center, but they're meeting on a weekly basis in a meeting room where they can share their goals and accomplishments and really the challenges relevant to the arm and hand. We remind them about the connection between the, the brain and lots of repetitions. And they talk to each other about what are the barriers for them to do the exercise, what is, and share some of the solutions that they've come up with, uh, commiserate with each other as well motivate each other and learn from each other. We also, if they have questions about particular exercises and how to do them, uh, so it's about an hour session per week. And we've really seen people develop friendships that last beyond the GRASS program. So this has been really a successful program. Um, I've seen it also done in the outpatient uh, units as well, but um, uh, we've actually implemented it in community centers. 
Uh, this is just one of the, the first time that we actually ran it in one of the community centers. This is just one of our advertisement, uh, advertisements for the group grass for stroke. And uh, this is the Fugelmeyer uh, motor recovery scale, which is one of the um, standardized uh, scales that's recommended for upper extremity function. And these are the participants. You can see this individual at the very low end is probably a little bit too low function and, and didn't make too much improvements, but the majority of the other people made really clini clinically significant improvements in their arm recovery. This program was over about eight to 10 weeks. And as I said, they're not doing the exercise um, at the community center. They were coming once a week for an hour, really to share their experiences. When COVID hit, we uh, pivoted our program uh, like many others, uh, and moved to a, a Zoom. And this was supported by the After Stroke BC and the March of Dimes Canada. And, and in this case, they used the Zoom. They also used the uh, breakout rooms um, and uh, used volunteers to help them. Uh, this was our first experience, uh, like many others. Uh, what I was actually really surprised about is the friendships that were made over Zoom. I, I, I didn't think the socialization would actually work, but in fact, it, it really did work and, and people did have a sense of community. I'm not sure if it was probably as effective as in person, but certainly we found that people did make friendships. And these are uh, this is a hand scale that we did. You can see the majority of people are improving from the baseline to the post, which was approximately eight weeks later. <laughs> and then another two months, they're retaining it. So this is just some of the com comments that we did a, um, a qualitative part of our study on the virtual grass program. Um, I think the best part of the class was the constant insistence that we use affected arm and we found new ways of using it and we are encouraged to share ideas and bring one or two uh, new ideas to class every week. The community aspect of being with other participants and getting to know them made me feel less alone and supported. So as I said, there was a feeling of you know social support with this Zoom um, initiative. So I, I was really pleased about that because that was something I thought that would be missing. Uh, this program is now being uh, rolled out as a, a national program by the March of Dimes Canada. So it's great that people across uh, Canada can access it. Uh, I still think they have a fairly small uh, number of people that, can, can, that they can take. And there's certainly many programs that offer it locally um, as well. It is offered by uh, different um, uh, people, in some cases, I would say it's uh, through occupational therapists and physical therapists. Uh, it's offered uh, with rehab assistance, uh, supervised by therapists or PT assistants as well. Uh, but we've actually used it um, with uh, lay people that we've also trained as well uh, with some support from therapy. So there are different ways of implementing this program. So what has helped move uh, grass to practice? Uh, it's for starters, we had high quality uh, multi-site randomized control evidence. Uh, we made the manuals free uh, via the internet so that it was accessible to people, patients, healthcare providers. Uh, it was a standardized program uh, with really, we tried to build in some fidelity that uh, people could ensure to make it similar from one site to another. Uh, we really try to understand through qualitative data to understand the barriers to implementation. I think this has helped us to get it, um, you know, up and running. Uh, a catchy acronym never hurts. Um, this particular program is inexpensive and it could be adopted into today's healthcare setting. It's not to say, I mean, I've done other studies uh, using ex robotic exoskeletons that are more expensive and but there are different um, barriers that you have to get over for such um, treatments. Uh, we partnered with the health authorities and nonprofits 
uh, and that really helped to move it into a sustainable position. It's also been translated into multiple languages, and uh, this has been really helpful. We don't translate them. I really hope they are accurate, um, but we get clinicians who always say, you know, I have a physical therapy student who can translate it in Korean for you. Would you like that? And we say, fantastic. So we, we haven't had any complaints about our translations, but we hope they are accurate. We've also um, looked at uh, increasing some of the technology um, options. Uh, this is a trial. We're just analyzing the data. It was a, three, a very short three-week program that combined grass with a sensor that then uh, talked to a tablet of how many repetitions they were actually doing. So this particular sensor counted how many times they opened and closed the hand during these particular tasks and provided that feedback. So we're just, we've uh, published a protocol and we're just analyzing the uh, data. And it was collected over six sites in Canada. So I'm going to just uh, switch gears for uh, the last uh, part of this talk and talk about implementation for walking recovery after stroke. So walking recovery is typically uh, the number one priority that we hear from people uh, with lived experience and that they want to improve their walking, that they want to walk faster, um, they want to fall less uh, because falls are a major, major issue after a stroke. So we've developed a number of programs um, after uh, to improve walking recovery. And one of the programs we we have developed is called the FAME program. So this stands for the Fitness and Mobility Exercise Program. And uh, it um, has a manual. Uh, we have it actually at the uh, fameexercise.com uh, website. And this is the very detailed uh, manual that we developed. Um, and this contrasts, although we this particular program, we've published a lot of, I think about eight different separate trials. But you know, each of those trials they're in published papers and, and they're about eight to 10 page, pages. Um, and the journals do not allow you to have a lot of detail. In fact, you know, the methods are usually about four paragraphs. So there's just no way that you can communicate exactly how do you actually do this particular protocol. So these kind of knowledge translation vehicles like this manual really allow us to get into, you know, what are, um, this is actually the, um, the exercise uh, manual for the um, person uh, implementing it. Uh, we actually have another book with just all the pictures. So information about stroke, the core principles, how do you do it, implement it, monitoring the intensity, um, uh, maximizing adherence and uh, resources. So we developed FAME really based on research I had done in the, the 10 years prior on looking at what is it that improves uh, walking after stroke. Um, and we know that lots of repetitions is really necessary. Uh, how do we improve uh, strength? And in the early days, I had run a number of, of randomized control trials looking at uh, strengthening using weights or uh, a machine like um, a Cybex where you actually push against the lever. Uh, so, you know, standard weight training um, things you'd find in the gym. And what we found is that although that type of equipment does improve strength after stroke, because of the coordination problems after stroke, it doesn't actually transfer over into function like walking faster or being able to get out of the chair faster. So it was at that point that we and actually the rest of the field really switched to doing much more functional strengthening. So repetitive, you know, getting out of a chair rather than having someone sit in a chair and use a weight on their leg to extend the knee. It's much better to to do weight bearing activities um, where they're actually putting weight through their limbs and having to balance at the same time, whether it's walking or, or rising from a chair. Uh, we've also done a whole series of studies on uh, perturbations so that uh, many, many years ago, so if you push somebody 
how do they actually respond? And we know that's important for recovery for, for their balance. Um, and so we have some perturbations and rapid stepping within the program in here. Uh, we also know that heart disease is the number one cause for um, after a stroke, as in the regular population, uh, but it's actually increased after stroke. The risk of someone having another stroke is uh, very, very high. It's actually one in three or one in four. Um, and fitness is really an important part of, of, of reducing the risk for another stroke. Uh, we know that osteoporosis is a major concern and then falls in fracture because the bone is osteoporotic. So lots of repetitive limb loading is helpful uh, for improving bone. And we've actually looked at improving bone density after the FAME program. And then exercises to improve balance. All of this is really we've put into stations. And, you know, typically um, exercises for older adults will do three sets of 10. And we don't do that. We do stations of five where they're five minutes where they are doing lots of repetitions. And that's really, as we said from the beginning, thousands of repetitions are required after a stroke. These are some of the improvements that we found from the FANE program. We've implemented it, as I said, in, in many different sites, but these are from the clinical trials that we've run. We found about a two to five point improvement in the Berg balance scale. Uh, and this is to say, just to remind you that the majority of our trials all use an active control group. Um, and this means that our improvements will be slightly less then if you simply have a trial that is either having a, a control group that stays at home or a weightless control group. So in all of the majority of our trials, we have them doing, they're coming to the center three times a week, which activates them or two to three times a week. They are doing something like weight bearing or Tai Chi or yoga. So they're actually up on their feet um, and doing something active as well in comparison. Uh, we found that, uh, after the FAME program, when we've tracked falls for the following year, there was one and a half time more falls in the control group, so less falls in the FAME group. Um, not surprisingly, because there is a lot of walking with the program, that we improved the six-minute walk test by about 25%. We've improved the activity-specific balance confidence scale, uh, so really a fear of falling scale by six to ten points. We've improved uh, VO2 max, so um, cardiovascular fitness, uh, muscle strength, we've actually measured of the lower extremity is 20 to 25%. Um, the hip bone density is in interesting because we've actually shown in our trials that we can actually maintain hip bone density, but we actually didn't improve it. But we found the control group actually lost bone density. And this is typical because if you're not repetitively weight bearing in that limb, which is very common after stroke, you continue to lose bone density. Uh, and actually this last paper was just published in December um, and uh, was run by my colleague, uh, Dr. Teresa Lou Ambrose, who looked at people with stroke who had some uh, cognitive impairment. And this is actually the first, I would say, a large randomized controlled trial to show um, a definitive improvement in cogn cognition. And this is using the ADS-COG. Uh, this study powered the study to look at cognition. If you look at all the other studies, they, they, their primary outcome was to look at walking and they happened to look at cognitive impairment. We selected the individuals based on their cognitive impairment and our primary outcome was on cognition. So it's published in the High Impact Journal JAMA Open. It actually had three groups. It had a FAME group. It had a group that was doing uh, stretching and yoga. And it actually had a third group that was doing uh, cognitive activities and social activities. And the exercise group improved cognition better than the uh, stretching weight-bearing group. And it also improved it more than the social cognition group.
So um, this is, uh, we're doing a lot of sub-analysis on this data now, looking at the cost effectiveness of this. Uh, so there'll be further papers coming out from this data set. These are some of the uh, principles that we have developed um, with the FAME. Uh, and again, to ensure that we are actually getting adherence uh, with our program. So in this case, we've ensured that they are actually progressing the exercise, um, that they are actually doing a lot of repetitions, and there isn't a lot of resting. In fact, what we encourage is that if a patient or participant has to rest, uh, they sit down, and we actually have a list of about eight exercises which they can do while they're actually sitting. So they can use different par body parts. So they can uh, march while they're sitting. Uh, there's some other exercises that they can, uh, weight shifting from one side to another. So if they're tired and you want to reduce, you know, what you don't want is somebody who is very tired, has potential for fall and still standing, but we have them in sitting and they can do some exercises. And that is to keep their heart rate up because once they sit for a while and get their heart rate down, it's actually hard to get their heart rate back up again. So we're trying to get some type of cardiovascular endurance going. Um, one of the other uh, portions is to look at the intensity and the monitoring. So are they monitoring the intensity? And it can be through a heart rate monitor, uh, but more commonly uh, they might have posters around that have the rating of perceived exertion and simply asking participants, how hard do you think you're working? Are you working hard? Are you working uh, somewhat hard? And get people familiar with the ratings of perceived exertion uh, so that they can actually start self-monitor and know that they're supposed to be working, you know, at least somewhat hard, that they are able to uh, carry on a conversation, but, you know, they're their conversation starts to become breathy because they're starting to take, you know, um, some gas in between some of the words. So they're not able to speak comfortably throughout a, a sentence. We also in, really encourage normal posture and movement. Um, and when I say that, it really is biomechanical principles. So are they keeping their shoulders back uh, and their head straight? As we know, with age, you get that um, stoop posture. Are they weight bearing on the predic limb? This is something really common. As soon as we see individuals get up from a chair and they have a stroke, we always see them uh, extend uh, their predic leg. So they put their, their weaker leg in front. And by doing this, they don't have to weight bear as much on that leg. Uh, so really getting them to, to even up their legs or even scoot the uh, the stroke affected leg a little bit backwards. So when they get out of the chair, they're actually forcing their use that they lean right and they lean left and, and it's equal that they're really weight bearing. We are less concerned about the compensatory movements. And this is something that we've had large discussions with some of the clinicians because they often don't want to progress the exercise because they say, oh, when I do that, I see a lot of spasticity come into play. Uh, there is substantial evidence now that uh, spasticity is temporary and doing intensive exercise does not permanently in increase spasticity. And in fact, it can reduce the tone over the long term. So that is something that we really uh, encourage uh, therapists to work through unless there is something like pain or hyperextension of the knee. And then there's other things to work through to figure out how to avoid pain or how to avoid hyperextension. And uh, the core components, as I mentioned, are functional strengthening, the agility and fitness, and the balance, uh, and encouraging people. So we've evaluated uh, the um, uh, different aspects of the uh, fidelity uh, using this uh, fidelity checklist and found that it did improve over time with the um, uh, people uh, delivering the program that they were really, it's really helpful when you, um, uh, we do training workshops and we tell them this is the fidelity checklist so that when you go out, you know, this is what uh, you would be evaluated on. In terms of knowledge translation, uh, FAME has been implemented in uh, many sites, um, in particularly uh, uh, in Canada. Uh, 
worldwide is over 600 sites, including inpatient and outpatient uh, and community centers. These are sites that we've purposely actually implemented and worked with these sites, but we have sites all over the world. I was working with someone from the US who's implementing it into their PT program as in their clinic. And actually in Vancouver, in, at UBC, we've implemented it as part of our student-led uh, clinic at UBC. So our students um, can do a placement within uh, the UBC physical therapy department where we have some space. Uh, they are supervised by uh, a physical therapist and, and do some one-to-one -one treatment. But we actually have, at one point, we actually had six classes of FAME that were running. Uh, we run it as fame for neural fitness and so that it is looking at individuals with uh, stroke parkinson's ms um, tbi and the students are actually running it as a group class and have found it really really uh, a good learning experience not only to getting to know different neurological populations but how to actually supervise a group safely um, because it is not, it can be challenging trying to figure out how you can challenge people safely, um, as opposed to one on one where you can actually do a lot more, but it simply is not cost effective. So this program, you know, because it is a group program, we can reduce the price to something like $15 per session, which makes it a lot more affordable, um, for our, for participants to, to do. Uh, implementation has been facilitated by our randomized controlled trials, our manuals, our, our I think the FAME program, uh, because it's a catchy name, has been really helpful. And um, this group program has really reduced uh, the costs. Uh, this is just an example of one of our sites uh, in the Interior Health uh, Authority of, of how they actually ran FAME. So we went up there and um, we taught a number of people interested in learning about fame and that included their PT and PT assistants in their outpatient rehab hospital. So they were running it there as a group program. Then uh, they were running fame in the community center and we taught fitness instructors at the same time in the same day session workshop. Uh, they already had a health navigator. So this was an interesting um, entity that I, I hadn't seen before. It was actually a health authority staff. It was a PT who worked a couple hours a week um, and screened patients at the community center for programs. So this included programs. They had a Parkinson's program, a healthy heart program, kind of a frail older adult program, and the FAME program. So, and, and then I think this is, we're really seeing a shift um, in community centers, uh, really stepping up to adopt uh, programs that really uh, cater to people with chronic disease that are more frail that, than before. And so this individual really helped people to find out, you know, which program would fit them the best. And what they, we, we found by having this combination of this outpatient where they could transfer them to the community center, that it actually reduced the hospital wait time for outpatient PT services by 31 days. Because they could take more within this group, they could move them out faster to the community center. So it was a real success story. The other uh, piece that was really helpful is that patients were got familiar with the FAME program in the outpatient rehab setting, and they said that they felt comfortable because it was the same program that they knew in the community center. And this is an interesting part of FAME. I, I often find that um, the instructors, whether they're a PT or a fitness instructor, they often want to change it up, and they go, well, you know, the, the, the exercises are all the same from session, session to session, and we, we have about I know it's about 35 exercises that are in, in the manual. But when we actually interview the participants, they actually really like the redundancy. They like that the fact that they're doing the same exercises, as long as they're challenged and progress, they feel comfortable with it. And there's this comfort around it. Well, I find it's the instructors that get kind of bored with it and that want to change things up. But I, I really don't think there's a need to, because whenever we interview the participants, they like that familiarity of the exercises. 
we also pivoted fame um, during the pandemic. And uh, this is not a study that I did, but it's a colleague of mine in Quebec, where they did a, a home-based group program. Uh, we call it the fame at home. And what we actually did is we took the exercises that were easier, um, required less spotting, um, and could also be done in a frame, which if you're watching an individual, they're not moving out of the frame, so you could actually see that person. Uh, and so they actually showed the safety of it, the feasibility, and improvements in mobility from this particular program. So in conclusion, who will move research to practice? As healthcare providers, you are key uh, in the chain, um, you know, taking evidence, uh, figuring out how to implement it, then move it into uptake into practice with fidelity. Uh, without you, we cannot do that. So um, we hope that you'll look at ways of um, taking best evidence and figure out how to implement it. I'd like to just acknowledge our many graduate students and postdocs and some of our staff that have been instrumental in um, fame and grass activities uh, and getting it into practice, as well as our funders, uh, especially the Canadian Institute of Health Research, the Canadian Partnership for Stroke Recovery, uh, our university and uh, Vancouver Coastal Health Research Institute, and the GF Strong Rehab Center, where uh, much of the research is started before we then spread it out to multi-sites. Thank you for listening and happy uh, to take questions. Uh, thanks so much, Janice. Uh, really great talk, really practical. Um, I just wanted to educate you a little bit to remind you that in the Northeast here in Ontario, we have um, a post-stroke transitional care program in six um, cities and towns across the Northeast that offer both FAME and GRASP. Uh, so um, I know that it's being Im implemented in the community. Uh, many of our hospitals and outpatient programs also um, utilize the GRASP program. Uh, so we're really excited to hear you talk about it today. Um, you did do some GRASP training with our group this past year, uh, which everyone really loved. And so they're kind of chomping at the bit to see <laughs> when we could get the training for the groups for doing GRASP. So I will connect with you and ensure that we get on your list for that group training uh, in the next coming year if we can. We have a number of questions, so please type your questions into the ask a question box and I will relay them to Janice. Uh, just a quick reminder to click on the evaluation link for the session in the bottom right hand corner. Just takes a minute to fill out while we're going through the uh, the Q&A. So our first question, when you have a group of patients in a grass group, do you try to have them all at a similar similar level or are various levels of recovery okay? Uh, so in terms of the grass group, it depends. So some people do a grass group in the outpatient setting where they have a large table and the equipment there and they bring the patients down and so they're actually treating the individuals on a daily or three times a week program. And um, in that, and, and ensuring that they actually get the repeti repetitions right there. In that case, then we find it's best to actually separate the individuals so that you have some on this side that are lower and some that are higher functioning. Because as the therapist or rehab assistant goes around, they it's easiest to deal with individuals if if there are low and high individuals functioning side by side, um, just because the needs of generally people with the lower functioning are higher, they need a little bit more help with managing the equipment. If they're doing the community grass where they're actually coming once a week, where really it's not about doing the exercises, it's about motivating individuals and having them talk together, then it doesn't really matter whether people are side by side, low or high functioning, because it really is a support group. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next question is, in the study with the sensor when doing grass, do the patients get to see their number of reps? Just wondering if the feedback could be motivating, trying to increase the number of reps from day to day, something like those who try to better their times in Strava. Yeah. 
So that's what it's supposed to be. We, uh, <laughs> the tablet tells you, and we have a target starting out at 500. And then it, if they're already doing more than that, then it kind of increases by, you know, 10%. So light Strava. Um, whether that is beneficial, motivating, or demotivating, I'm not sure because uh, we haven't, we, well, we've, we've finished the trial, we collected it, we're analyzing data. We also have um, qualitative data where we interviewed the, the participants and we also interviewed the clinicians um, and the families. So we're just transcribing all of that data and we'll see. I'm, I, I know some people have said it's motivating, um, but whether that's a theme that we'll find across, that's something we'll find out as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and moving to fame and the improvements in fame, how did you measure the lower, lower extremity muscle strength? Uh, so we do it a, a couple ways. Um, the common way is we use a handheld dynamometer. And the standardized way is that you actually uh, look at knee extension. So the knee is in a 90-90-90 or the hip is in 90-90-90. So you're sitting like as you are in this position and you push. It is also recommended that you have a strap that straps around the knee that then goes around the back of the chair. So if you have a really strong patient, um, if generally I find it's not always needed for stroke, especially if you're looking in early subacute stroke, because they're not that strong. But if you are looking more in chronic and you, or if you're comparing the right to the left knee, then, and the good knee, then having that strap is really helpful. So it's just a handheld uh, myometer, and they have been shown to be valid and reliable. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, is there a specific strong study on relaying the idea that increased spasticity with exercise is temporary? You had mentioned that earlier. Is there a... When you mentioned spasticity with increased exercise being temporary, is there a strong study that kind of backs that up? So there's many, many studies um, that have both looked at it mechanistically and then have also looked at spasticity. So even in our own trials, so uh, our FAME trials, we, we, any of our FAME trials, we, we actually measure spasticity and show that it, it does not increase or actually it decreases. So there's many studies that do that. Uh, we actually did the walk in, oh, sorry, the dose trial. Some of you know, we did over six sites. Um, recently where we had people target uh, 2,000 steps. And we, we did a couple sub-analysis on that data set looking at compensatory uh, movements um, and actually tone. And they either decreased or were the same. The other thing that's really helpful is the American um, Physical Therapy uh, Association now has a whole toolkit about intensive exercise and a, and a whole brochure about spasticity. And um, I believe within that toolkit, they I'm not sure if they have references, but they talk about the evidence behind that. So that's on the American Physical Therapy Association and they have a whole toolkit. It's Their topic is called Intensity Matters. So if you Google Intensity Matters, American Physical Therapy Association, you'll get, it's really nice. It's, it's quite a lot of content that they have on this whole topic really develop as a knowledge translation tool to facilitate increasing intensity um, within um, neurological rehab. Great, great, thanks. We'll check that one out for sure. Um, we have a question about the FAME program. Was there a specific age of people considered during the research and also if minimum cognition score was considered for intake? So in terms of, um, Fame, uh, in terms of the minimum age, we, we, we haven't restricted it. So I think probably the oldest is probably 93 that's been in it and youngest has been in their 20s. So we haven't had an age restriction. In terms of cognition, yes. We haven't had a specific number, but we've asked on our screening that they're able to follow uh, commands, um, if there are issues with that, then we require a caregiver. They must be able to use a washroom independently. If not, then we require a caregiver. So that kind of, even that requirement in itself, 
places restrictions on cognition and whether a, a caregiver is re required or not. Right. Great. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify when you spoke about grasp at the Killarney Community Centre, uh, who leads the discussion there? Was it trained lay people and, and do you need um, allied health associated with that? So in that particular one, we actually had a retired occupational therapist mm. uh, run it. We've also had a kinesiologist that we've trained who ran it as well uh, and trained under um, an occupational therapist. Um, we've also generally had one lead person who's leading the discussion and often some volunteer uh, people that help circulate. The volunteers really are generally we often get wannabe OTs and PTs who want some volunteer time, but really in the fame that's run on a weekly basis, it's really someone who actually has very good skills on motivating. So people who've had motivated, motivational interviewing skills are really, really helpful because, you know, reflecting back and getting people to think about their situation is really helpful. So it's more about motivating people more than anything. Right. So that's why I wondered if it needed to be a specific um, professional background or if it could be just someone that's really good at motivation and, and eliciting conversation in a group setting. Yeah. I mean, I guess the thing is we get questions all the time from participants that are therapeutic in nature. So if that individual has access to someone, they can ask questions. That is really helpful because they, they can say, well, I'm, I don't know the answer to that question, but let me talk to X about that and I'll tell you next time. So I think that works quite well. Um, obviously, with the training, we go through, even with the workshop we did with GRASS, we go through some of the basic concepts of of arm pain uh, and not raising the arm above the shoulder if they have pain and, and things like that. And what does spasticity mean and what does it look like? Uh, but they might have other questions that a health professional can answer. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I think I'm going to uh, wrap it up. Uh, thank you so much for such an excellent talk and strategies that we can use. And I don't know, it's just so down to earth and easy to understand and bring back to our practice next week. So we appreciate the time you took to be with us, Janice. And we hope you enjoy your eight degree weather in Vancouver today <laughs> as we enjoy the minus 42 wind chill factor here. Okay, Anyways. thanks Sue. Thanks. Thank all. you.